It is Friday, March 12th. Let's talk PlayStation. Hello everyone, welcome back. Let's start off as always with our PS Plus reminder. The March games are currently available. For PS4 you're getting Remnant from the Ashes, Firepoint for PSVR, and of course Final Fantasy VII Remake. For PS5 you're getting just the PS5 version of Maquette, and also until April 6th, uh, Destruction All-Stars is still up there as well. Make sure you grab that. And then also the uh, Play at Home initiative is currently live, so even if you're outside of a Plus membership, you can head to the PS Store right now and grab the 2016 Ratchet and Clank remake for free. Again, outside of a Plus membership, so if you don't own this game, you can go ahead and do that as well. Now for our first story, let's jump into the PS5 dev kit of all things. This was fun when we were uh, discussing PS5 news and things like that up to the actual release of the console, but remember, uh, we had some initial patent images, I think was the first glimpse of it, and then we had a bunch of leaks thereafter that were kind of, you know, they always are shot with a potato, basically. They, they're blurry and, you know, obscured a little bit. I mean, I guess the first leak was a very high-resolution quality image, but it was, like, too close. Either way, um, this past week, we actually got some very clear-as-day photos of what a PS5 dev kit today actually looks like, and just thought it was interesting. Uh, it was certainly fun building up to this where we had to constantly explain that no dev kits don't normally ever look like the final retail hardware, so people were you know, very polarized at how this thing looked, and yeah, it does look very weird, and it's actually quite large if you look at uh, the measuring tape on the bottom there, but hey, we have the console today, we know what it looks like, and it's always, it, it feels like it was forever ago, right? But it was actually, what, a little over a year ago? We had the first uh, initial leak somewhere around there, so, you know, hindsight's everything, but that thing is, is also quite massive. Now, moving on to our next news story, there was a visual bug reported on Twitter where it shows a PS5 version of Bloodborne on the PlayStation Store. So on PS5, for most games, there's a product page and it has an option for three little dots. When you hit that, you can get a breakdown of legal data, but also multiple versions of a game if it's available, a demo, um, a streaming option if it's on there, right? But basically, this showed a PS5 version of Bloodborne being available. Now you click it, it doesn't do anything. There wasn't many reports of people running into this as far as I can see. This was actually from last week, so right on Friday after, you know, LTPS was uploaded, but uh, since then, nothing to really report. So essentially, this was probably a fluke, a visual bug, something like that. It happens quite frequently on the PlayStation Store, so sometimes when this happens, it's always, you know, thrown around like maybe this is an indicator that a game's actually coming. And we did have a rumor about Bloodborne coming to PS5 and PC, and that was a few months back, or maybe it I don't know, it feels like it was a while ago now, actually, but of course, nothing has really told us that it actually is inherently coming. Uh, but, I mean, we did have a story recently that Sony is, in fact, uh, looking at more PC releases for, you know, their IP. And let's face it, Bloodborne, I actually think, is a great fit because naturally, when you expect a PC release, you would hope at the bare minimum they send out a patch to unlock the frame rate on the PS4 version. So, if you do that, that gives us 60 FPS on PS5. But, Really, you would expect a native PS5 port, so that way Sony can easily, you know, sell the game again for $60, $60 if they want to, throw in the DLC, and you really don't have to do much. This is a straightforward job when it comes to what is inherently still a PlayStation 4 game, right? So give it that FPS boost, resolution boost, um, you know, maybe add those performance settings that we really enjoy nowadays. Uh, you can do a little bit in terms of extra visual fidelity and flair and things like that. I mean, there are some enhancements that can be made, but inherently this is not... A full remake or something from the ground up so i mean i think i speak for a lot of people when i say we would love to have bloodborne on playstation 5 but this probably isn't what's going to tell us if it's coming or not next up if you recall on a number of occasions back in late november and most of december when we were talking about ps5 stock it was largely the fact that hey it's a brand new console so it's going to be very hard to get especially during the holiday period but let's wait until the first quarter of 2021 and then we'll see if it improves or not of course, we're living that right now. It's not much better. Uh, now we're almost towards the end of the of the first quarter of 2021, and it's still very tough to get a PS5. Although certain restocks and drops are, you know, slightly improving. So depending on what territory that you're in, uh, the console may be in stock for over a minute now. At this point, I've seen some people actually report. Uh, upwards of 30 minutes that the machine's actually available to order, which is giving you that larger, you know, window of time to actually place an order. Uh, but one uh, retailer, I believe, Curry's PC World, is doing a lottery system, which this isn't the first time we've seen this, but it's just an example, right? So a lottery system is where they'll just take a bunch of 
uh, they'll take your email basically and if you win the opportunity to purchase a PS5 they'll send you an email and that's when you can um, you know you have 72 hours you have a, a very large window to go order the machine at your leisure and it's not a stressful crazy situation but a lottery system is still also frustrating because they're kind of sending your name out into a void and then just praying that you're given the opportunity to give a company you know 500 something dollars and not have to pay markup but I did recently just looked at the sold completed listings on eBay. The machines are now selling at around $750. So even, you know, for that, it's it's not super lucrative. It's not as lucrative as it was when the machine just came out. So it's it's getting there. I think, you know, mid-2021 maybe <laughs> will be in much better shape. But for now, at least, it's still difficult to get one. Now for our next news story, Destruction All-Stars recently received the patch 1.3.1. Uh, I feel like at this point I'm one of the few people still actually talking about the game, but you know, at the very minimum for what is a PlayStation Studios game, uh, Lucid Games has been very, uh, very good to push out a lot of these patches and updates and fixes for a game that really does need it. So this recent patch added the 8v8 Mayhem mode that's only going to be available for about two weeks. Also, nine new all-star skins, including two heroic and one legendary, so it's very good that there's more rewards, there's some incentive there. Uh, the weekly challenges now reward destruction points and all-star coins, so destruction points were the premium currency, so now you can actually earn those for free instead of paying for it. And you also get increased all-star coins received on level up, and then a ton of other stability improvements and fixes. I think at this point moving forward, because I know there's just not that much engagement with this game, we'll probably not cover every single patch, but you know, major changes and things like that to the game. Um, but right now you have until April 6th to claim it. If you don't have a PS5, you can still claim it through desktop or mobile, so you can try it by the time you get a PS5. And uh, after April 6th, if you don't claim it, it'll be available for $20, which I think is a, a fair price, but considering how many people are not playing the game at this point and kind of over it uh you know i think it's going to take some serious work for lucid to kind of turn this one around and i'd like to be optimistic but mm, you know it's not looking too good next up it's our new story of the week one that we can't really ignore of course because it's quite large and certainly there's some playstation implications so we're of course talking about what will be our probably our final ish update on Microsoft acquiring ZeniMax Media, the parent company of Bethesda Softworks, for $7.5 billion. So at the start of the week, this was finally nearing completion, the acquisition, mind you, and Microsoft is now getting ready to talk about it. So on Tuesday, we got a blog right up on Xbox Wire from Xbox head Phil Spencer. He said, and I quote, with the addition of the Bethesda creative teams, gamers should know that Xbox consoles, PC, and Game Pass will be the best place to experience new Bethesda games, including some titles in the future that will be exclusive to Xbox and PC players. And that was really our first time where it was explicitly stated that some games will be exclusive. But of course, that was obvious. It's really to the extent of what will, what won't but we had rumors and things like that suggesting that Thursday, so yesterday, there would be a, a round table discussion actually confirming or really having a more direct approach about what the acquisition means for Bethesda, for Xbox, for the Xbox customer, and that is certainly what happened as well. And uh, well, this is where we can pull another pretty long quote here from Phil Spencer, and this is uh, pretty much the answer that we've got up to today, which is, I'm going to try to be as clear as I can because that's what I, I just think it's fair. So obviously I can't sit here and say every Bethesda game is exclusive because we know that's not true. There's contractual obligations that we're going to see through, as we always do in every one of these instances. We have games that exist on other platforms and we're going to go support those games on the platforms they're on. There are communities of players, we love those communities and we'll continue to invest in them. And even in the future, there might be things that have either contractual things or a legacy on a different platform that we'll go do. But if you're an Xbox customer, the thing I want you to know is this is about delivering great exclusive games for you that ship on platforms platforms where Game Pass exists, and that's our goal. That's why we're doing this. That's the root of this partnership that we're building and the creative capability we'll be able to bring to market for our Xbox customers. It is going to be the best it's ever been for Xbox after we're done here. Now, that is essentially our most up-to-date, final-ish answer on this whole transaction, which for the most part, it's pretty straightforward, right? So the exceptions here would be things like contractual obligations, which we were all expecting. That was actually confirmed day one with the acquisition being announced. So things like Ghostwire Tokyo, Deathloop, it's still coming, of course. Um, and that's how they ha they've handled it before. Also, service-based games were a safe bet. They weren't just going to randomly pull, say, Elder Scrolls Online or not continue support for that on PS4. But that's kind of like a understandable situation. I mean, same with things like, uh, well, Minecraft when they purchased Mojang. But 
that's you know it's an example but not a good example because minecraft is technically an outlier here um it's a big game but it's a monumental game so even when we you know talk about the usual suspects of say fallout uh starfield which is coming up soon or you hope it's coming up soon <laughs> elder scrolls um those are big franchises big games that's kind of where my initial line of thinking was was oh maybe those games will still come but you know you're still expecting a lot of this to go exclusive but minecraft was obviously much larger than all those games combined basically so understandable that that still ships and releases on playstation but either way um to get you brought up to speed on you know you know how i felt about this whole thing if you weren't watching some of the some of our initial conversations i did a video right when the acquisition was announced because this is really a very large transaction this is a, a pretty huge shakeup, and that's why it's been such a hot topic this entire time and people talking back and forth and debating and arguing and things like that now my initial line of thinking definitely was like okay big transaction big get for game pass that's certainly what they're going for um, but i did initially think maybe they could get away with still doing 70 dollars full releases on ps5 because their real benefit is game pass and you know even before this transaction even before the announcement they were at well, at the time, 15 million subscribers. Now they're at 18 million, which is nutty considering that Xbox One's install base for the majority of when Game Pass was available obviously wasn't nearly as uh, as much versus, say, the amount of PlayStation 4s that were on the market. And yes, it's available on PC, but you know, still, you can kind of see my point there. Uh, and it's incredible that they got to 18 million subscribers now, still before this transaction actually went through. So it's it's one of those things where I. To be honest, I feel like they still could have gotten away with, say, being straightforward, like, yeah, we'll ship, you know, certain full-scale games on PS5, but you better pay for it. I think they could have gotten away with that, but either way, obviously, they're probably going to go all in, and that's fine, too. I mean, the, the thing is, you totally knew that there was going to be some exclusive games on this. You don't spend that amount of money and don't do a certain level of exclusivity amongst all these games, but the, that's the other thing that I think a lot of people are glossing over here is that they are just staring at the usual suspects of Fallout starfield elder scrolls um, but hey even dooms a, a huge franchise here but a lot of people are like looking at those things right but remember this transaction uh, transaction includes um id software uh, arcane machine games tango gameworks and then you've got even alpha dog and roundhouse studios in there there's a lot of tech involved in here a lot of talent and you know this is something where it's it's a, an announcement that is like understandably bittersweet for people right because if you are an xbox customer you've for the longest time wanted uh you know microsoft to kind of step up to the plate here in terms of the first party output and the thing is for the other spectrum of it it's like okay well this was an established you know big third party publisher that has been putting out games on every platform uh, platform imaginable for the past 15 20 something odd years and that's why this was such a hot conversation to begin with i don't know how people weren't really seeing that especially the counter argument of oh if sony did this you know the games are exclusive well the idea there is that they wouldn't have done this in the first place because one they don't have the capital but two that's not how sony or even nintendo for that matter usually acquires studios they fund projects uh, brand new ip and they you, when they usually acquire a studio it's from a long-standing partner that the entire time if you were say playing on a competing platform it didn't affect you because they weren't releasing games on that platform to begin with right there's it's obvious why this was polarizing to begin with but you know ideally uh, Xbox customers for the longest time have wanted that that high quality first party output and let's face it uh, between I, I always like to akin it to late life cycle 360 uh, up to well I guess where we are today right because obviously the Xbox one generation was uh, I understandably disappointing and certainly from Microsoft's point of view um, they would have uh, liked some better performance there but they took a lot of missteps right and certainly that's where it started was late 360 life cycle um, because that's where they were kind of a little misguided in terms of where they were going with their first party output you know focusing way too much on connect and then of course the disaster that was the xbox one launch um, and that's what was so exciting about the line of series consoles in the last two years is that they were getting very aggressive with not only things like game pass which is such a good deal but also uh, acquiring all these studios and it's just that Bethesda, of course, is one that's going to upset a lot of people. Microsoft, of course, wants to make the case that, well, if it's on Game Pass, that's where we'll, you know, support it. And, you know, the considering that they've probably approached every publisher and developer imaginable, because that's just what they've been doing lately. So, you know, conversations have been taking place with 
more than likely as many um, companies as you could think. I'm sure they probably approached Sony or Nintendo to some degree and uh, maybe tried to start that conversation, but it didn't pan out, of course. Sony's not going to allow that or be too thrilled with that uh, with that conversation, so they're probably okay with letting this go. And that's the thing to remember is that um, this can happen and everything's fine. For one, you can still play these games. You can buy an Xbox console. It's not the end of the world. You could play on PC, you have options. Um, the way I like to look at it is I want a healthy industry first, right? I want the games first, platform second. That's always been how I approach it. Don't like the fanboy stuff, never did. Uh, preferences are okay. That's why most people play on one particular machine and they always choose a place for third-party software. So I, I get why it's you know annoying for people and things like that. Or <laughs> some people are just like, oh, I guess I'm never playing these again. But you can, if you have the money, if you have the time, you can still buy that extra a Series S on the side, a Series X on the side, or build a PC. You know, you have, these games didn't leave. They're still there. Um, and at the very least, this will probably paint a healthier Microsoft in the games business. And that's, I want that. I, it's, I don't know if that's a hot take, but that's something that I actually uh, would prefer to have. And well, now a Game Pass subscription is going to get me all these games for essentially nothing. Or well, $15 a month, which is not a bad deal. Now, we should also probably touch on just the wording that was used because this is where some are still hanging on by a thread. That Tuesday post did mention some games will be exclusive. And then the Thursday roundtable, that quote that we just went over, uh, Phil Spencer did say contractual or legacy things they might go off and do. You know, what does legacy really mean? Uh, but obviously, there's still going to be a slight gray area. But I mean, if that, it's a small crack in the door, if you will, in case they ever decide to actually do something, do something or explore more. But I mean, at this point, we still have a pretty clear answer directly from Phil, which is that expect a lot of exclusive games for the Xbox customer. So that's why we really don't need to humor it any further unless they ever do decide to do something right. And when that happens, if it happens, rather, um, you know, we'll have a new story and talk about it. But for now, at least the entire point of this roundtable was to have the conversation and have this answer out there. And I think that was honestly the best approach. Um, you know, we don't want to, they don't want a situation where once all these developers are to, are actually ready to start showing off their software, the last thing they want to deal with is, is this, right? Answering uh, the question of exclusivity, you know, what are you going to do? Is it going to ship over or, or what have you, right? They don't want to have to deal with that stuff. So do it now, let it simmer down. And then once you see Bethesda stuff, you just kind of have this expectation of, all right, yeah, this is, you know, Xbox stuff. Um, and that's what we're expecting this coming June around the E3 timeframe when we see um, announcements out of Microsoft and Bethesda. So that's where we are. Moving on to our next news story. This past week, Gorilla Games finally showed off their brand new Amsterdam offices, fully renovated. If you remember a while ago, they announced that they were acquiring the space and that they would be doubling staff from 200 to 400, which right now they're at about 350 to take on multiple projects, which we're all familiar with at this point. But they also did show off this uh, gorgeous office, which I would be proud to work in a space like this. It's got a beautiful view of the city. It's got a life-size stalker statue from Horizon and what I'm guessing is the lobby or somewhere around there. Um, but it is, I guess, poor timing, of course, because we've got the COVID situation, which has dramatically changed how certain businesses handle their day-to-day -day operations. And so for companies that are even returning to the office right now, they're allowing employees to do two, three days working from home or even you know, indefinitely working from home, which is a great option depending on where you live. Um, Amsterdam is a great walkable city. So an office like this, I mean, I would, I would go there every day if I could, but Hey, at least, um, you know, they finally got this thing all set up and it really does look fantastic. And this is actually a good segue to our next news story, which is job opportunities at Gorilla Games. So recently we had a job listing pop up for a senior external development producer, which carries a number of responsibilities, but namely it says Gorilla is looking for an experienced game producer to oversee and manage externally produced game projects. You will look at projects holistically and monitor project progress across all disciplines, report on progress and flag risks. In addition, you will work with Sony Publishing to plan the go-to market strategy. And towards the bottom, it says for pluses, you have extensive knowledge of Horizon Zero Dawn. So normally when it comes to job listings, it can go one of two ways. One, it's not indicative of anything and some sites will report a job listing that just tells us that they're working on a game and that's not surprising at all. But we could also have a listing where it's more specific and it gives us an idea of what their next project will actually be or what it will look like. And this is somewhere in the middle because this kind of reads as though it could just be for a producer role overseeing contract work. So that's very common in game development where they'll contract out animations or mocap or whatever 
whatever the case may be for that particular game. Uh, but it does call out certain things like working directly with Sony Publishing and also having experience with Horizon Zero Dawn. So that's something that we can tie right away to the previous rumor about Fire Sprite Studios working on a Horizon VR spinoff. So that would make reasonable sense. But the thing to remember, too, is that with the recent closure of Japan Studios uh, multiple departments, one of them being the external development department, Sony said in response to that that those departments would be spread across all of SIE on a global scale. And so what does that really look like? Well, probably something like this, where depending on the location and uh, the frequency of that studio, you know, they might be able to house uh, more employees to handle and oversee that external development. And so this would maybe be the case where Gorillas they're still expanding, they have that new studio, maybe this is something where they really will oversee um, externally de developed projects that, well, we know Sony loves doing them, right? And actually, we've got a few other job listings to go over here. So for London Studio, as an example, they recently posted a listing for an executive producer uh, in mobile development. Now, this one is pretty clear in terms of what it's saying here. You will partner with large multinational mobile publishers to ensure that the mobile titles that we deliver will have the quality gamers will expect from PlayStation Studios. Now, this might be alarming considering that this is coming from London, but uh, like we just mentioned, they could be distributing all this external development across all their studios, right? So we already have other job listings actually at London Studio telling us that they're working on, you know, a more traditional uh, AAA game actually. There was even one recently for a lead online programmer. Uh, but we also have an animator and developer that uh, people noticed under his, um, his previous work experience uh, located in the greater San Diego area at Sony Interactive Entertainment. There is two upcoming AAA PS5 titles where he was a uh, cinematic and gameplay animation, mocap and hand key, and also uh, cinematic animation hand key. That's the work he did on that particular game. Um, I'm not sure we could read too much into this. This might just be something where he's calling out two separate projects, but maybe only one of these is coming. We have been told that that San Diego team or that secret San Diego location is either, well, one, it's the VASG group, so they do a lot of work outside of just one particular project, but also that secret team was working on multiple projects. So um, we can't really say too much on that front. And then also over at Naughty Dog, they recently had a listing for an economy designer multiplayer. Essentially, this would be somebody that is uh, well-versed in designing, implementing, and tuning game economy and player progression systems. You would also need experience in designing successful economies in PC or console multiplayer games. And well, there's our update on The Last of Us Faction. So it's been a while since we had a direct update regarding this. Uh, I guess unless you want to count Neil Druckmann saying, please wait, <laughs> more or less. But that's pretty much our short-term Naughty Dog project. We should be expecting that reasonably soon compared to say a full-scale AAA, you know, original IP or sequel game from them, right? So, but at least we know that whatever sort of multiplayer component for The Last of Us, whatever that looks like, at least it's still, you know, a thing. So yeah, I mean, obviously PlayStation Studios is very busy working on a number of projects and they are certainly expanding and it will be interesting to see how external development is really handled with Japan Studio no longer doing that basically. Next up, this is a pretty heartwarming news story, but the game director and creative director at Sucker Punch Productions that worked on Ghost of Tsushima, Nate Fox, and Jason Cannell were recently made permanent tourism ambassadors of the real Tsushima Island, which is really, it is, it's heartwarming. So basically the mayor expressed his gratitude for these developers shining the spotlight on the island and showing its beauty and allowing this sort of creative interactivity with the history and uh, the island itself, so that's really cool. He pretty much uh, expressed his gratitude there, and that is just lovely to see, right? Because, you know, you've got this Western studio that really just, they nailed it. Uh, the gamers over there really love it, and um, actually not that long ago, we also saw a crowdfunding uh, campaign. Uh, a lot of people were vouching in to repair a Tory gate that was damaged down there, and they exceeded the, the, the funding necessary by, I don't know, an obscene amount or something like that. Um, and a lot of people that donated to that were from playing Ghost of Tsushima. So that's just, that's also awesome to see. I love stories like that. Now, moving on to Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you could win a $10 PSN code. I would like to congratulate this viewer right here. I'll be contacting you very soon via email or Twitter. If you would like to win a $10 PSN code, it's very easy. 
follow the link down below supporting this channel a number of ways can gain you an entry and i'll announce the winner next week because i'm trying to pay for your games those are all the news stories that I want to talk about with you all. Our Tuesday video was about the overall PlayStation business and, you know, what they've done so far and where they're headed. Kind of a good retracing steps of what Sony said and how they've changed in the last five years or so and then trying to paint a picture of what they might be doing and looking like in the future. Go check that conversation out. And as always, we've got another video coming this Tuesday. And that's all I've got for you for now. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday.